So hello everyone, welcome to the structuring data session. Uh, the first talk uh, is uh, from Abhishek Dasgupta and Graham Lee on lessons from building a data platform during the pandemic. And before we start, uh, please do ask questions on Slido before or during the talk and at the end, and we'll go through them at the end of the talk. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, I'm a research software engineer in uh, University of Oxford and I'm going to present uh, these global.health lessons from building a data platform during the pandemic. So I know we are funded uh, initially by you know, google.org uh, who sent you know, their fellows to work on this project uh, and also by the Oxford Martin School and Rockefeller Foundation. And it's uh, you know, a consortium of multiple universities working on this project from all around the world. Uh, you know, we have Boston Children's Hospital, you know, Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, New uh, Northeastern, and or Oxford, and we also uh, you know, hope to partner with other institutions in the future. Uh, oh yes, on University of Washington, uh, Georgetown, and uh, the Gorgas Institute in Panama, uh, and we. Uh, also thank Mapbox and ProMed, uh, and Mapbox sort of does the geocoding for our uh, maps. So what's global at health? It's, you know, uh, it's we say it's the first of its kind, uh, global repository of line list data. What's a line list? It's a list of information about COVID-19 uh, patients uh, or people who've got COVID-19. And we started collecting this in the, from the beginning of the pandemic and also developing this platform so that people could uh, submit data or we could get data in from government agencies and put them into a unified uh, uh, schema. And this is all de-identified and uh, anyone can access it. So please sign up to our uh, website at global.health. And uh, as long as you agree to you know, TNCs, you can download the data and you can use it in your research. And please do that. Um, so our goal is to become the definitive resource for epidemiological data on not just COVID-19, but you know, emerging pathogens as well. So you know, it started with about 25 million cases back in February 2021, and now we're up to 100 million cases, and we're just limited by you know, uh, you know like just more people you know we, if we get more people we can have more data in uh, because you know there's government agencies you know all around the world publishing data and it's a fair amount of work to transform that all into one schema make sure that it's all being ingested properly uh, but we are now at 100 million cases uh, and that's the map uh, you know you can look at the country view we also have a you know, regional view so uh, and you can go and click and download any country data, or you can do filtering as well. So we also started collecting data on monkeypox. Uh, this uh, in starting May 2022. Uh, this was taken, I think, a month ago. The screenshot. We already up to 50,000 cases in this line list. Again, this is open. Uh, it's not integrated into our main data platform that runs global.health yet, but we do have a GitHub repository where you can freely download the data. So this is what it looks like in the data portal. When you log in, you can see a list of cases. These are all fake cases uh, uh, from a dev uh, portal. And you can sort of click any of them, get more detailed information. You can filter and you can download. This is what it looks like when you click on a case. So it shows uh, information and you know it's in various categories, demographic, location, event history, uh, outcome of the patient, uh, transmission characteristics, and travel history. Of course, not all data sources provide us with this rich detailed information, but we do try to get as much information as we can into this unified schema. And now Graham will talk about the beginnings of how Global Data Health started. Great, thanks Abhishek. So uh, the way that um, teams like uh, the Health Map team, who are at Boston Children's Hospital, who really started uh, the Global Health collaboration, 
work traditionally. Uh, when I say tradition, I mean going back to uh, outbreaks in like 2015, Zika virus in uh, Africa uh, and uh, various other outbreaks, is you have a collection of volunteers who read the news and they you know, read that there has been a confirmed case of you know, monkeypox in a hospital in Aberdeen and they write into a spreadsheet, a line in the spreadsheet that says, you know, Aberdeen, uh, any information they have about the, um, about the patient uh, and the date and then the source of this information. And that was what people were doing. So December uh, 20, uh, sorry, yeah, December 2019, January 2020 was a group of volunteers reading about that where the new uh, cases were coming. There are now cases in Italy. There are now cases on a cruise ship. There are now cases in uh, you know, Switzerland. That, both from a manual like work per, uh, point of view, became too much for a, a volunteer team to keep doing, and also hit the limits of what you could do with a Google spreadsheet. You can only have 5 million cells in a Google spreadsheet. And if you've got, say, 40 uh, columns, then you divide 5 million by 40. I wish I hadn't come up that number. It's something like 800,000. And you know that's how many rows you can have. And then you, um, you know, and, and like you can easily have that many cases in a single country in a few months with a very transmissible virus uh, like COVID-19. So then you start trying to like split the data into multiple spreadsheets and making sure that the different people working on the different spreadsheets are using the schema consistently or you, you know re representing data in the same way. Um, anyway, it very quickly became clear that we we're going to need a uh, more automated, more scalable uh, approach. And so uh, we approached Google.org and they uh, funded us and seconded us a team of uh, 12 engineers, UX specialists, project manager, um, uh, and other expertise to create this version of the portal that uh, Abshek has uh, shown you. And that work started in April 2020, and we launched that first version uh, in February. It's based on, uh, we might call it a microservices tech stack, although there's only really three microservices, so you know, uh, make your own judgments there. Uh, but we've got a, uh, a MongoDB database that's storing all of the, um, the case records, the line list as we call it, uh, and then um, AWS services on top of that. Kubernetes running our, uh, our code, AWS Lambda running some of the um, sort of scheduled or like uh, non-continuous parts of the work. So it looks like this. We now go from people reading the news and entering it into a form to uh, governments publishing uh, up-to-date information. And they do that in whatever way makes sense uh, for them. So some of them are publishing like a CSV file that you can just download from their website. Some of them are publishing um, PDFs with the latest data. Some of them are publishing JSON or um, you know, like Excel or whatever. Some of them are using you know, cloud-hosted data platforms. So we have to be able to support multiple ways of getting this data in. And so we have these scripts, which were initially run as lambdas, we'll come back to that, uh, that fetch the latest data from these sources and uh, one deposit it in S3 so that we've got a permanent record of the data we used to uh, populate the database and two convert it into our standard schema and then re uh, store these records in the database and that goes through an API called the curator service which is where all of the uh, data validation is done um, and that's the thing that gives the APIs to users that populates the uh, you know the portal that people can manipulate and view the data through uh, so the two um, visualizations, the like tab tabular portal and the map, both use the curator service to uh, get their data. Uh, the curator service does the authentication and the um, validation. The data service is doing the um, the CRUD activities, and then it calls out to a separate uh, process that contacts an external provider for doing geolocation for converting 
like information like this case was in Paris to a latitude and longitude uh, and a lo and like the richer information that Paris is a city in France and therefore this case was in France. There are Parises in other places and this has been one of the problems that we've uh, had with, uh, with, uh, with this project. So having even built the scalable version of this thing, unfortunately the COVID-19 pandemic proved itself far more scalable than any technology that we could uh, come up with. So um, AWS Lambda is a really easy tool for like launching scripts on events or on schedules. They get very limited resources in terms of the amount of memory they've got and the amount of runtime they've got. You can only run them for 15 minutes. The data set from the United States uh, CDC, I think now takes us about 48 hours to ingest from beginning to end, something like that. Yeah, so, maybe about a week. Oh, right. So, okay. So, yeah. so yeah, up to a week now, just to like from loading the file in to having read the last line of the file and converting it into a, um, you know, in, in, into our standard format is now seven days. Uh, that's that's longer than 15 minutes, maths fans. Uh, so we have to find a different way to work with that, and we use um, AWS Batch, which is really for you know this kind of big what they would call like an ETL, extract, transform, and load, and what we're calling ingestion. Um, but on the other hand, like while our data ingestion and processing needs are getting bigger and bigger, our user base isn't really that much. And one of the problems is that like, if you've got 100 million records and a download button, you're asking someone to download a CSV file with 100 million lines in it. Not many people want to do that. Once they have done it, Excel won't load it. Like, you know, Excel is only going to load something like a million rows. So we want to be able to give people programmatic access so that they can sort of filter on the bits of the data set that they're interested in and then um, only deal with those and preferably deal with them in a tool that can handle it, such as an R or a Pandas data frame. So we implemented filtered downloads both on the UI and as um, a Python and an R API that are exposed as libraries so people can uh, load these libraries and use our API through that. Along the way, we found that you know, the governance model of all of the gray logos that Abhishek showed on slide one isn't really suitable for a, an international uh, data platform that has data about like, uh, human, well, not even participants, because they have never opted into an experiment. They are people that we have data recorded about from other sources. So now we need to solve uh, governance problems, privacy problems. We need to conform not only to the GDPR, but to the privacy rules of every other country where people have got COVID-19. That's a lot of countries. Um, we don't have that expertise in-house. So this is the point where we started reaching out to uh, partner organizations. So um, AWO, an agency who specialize in uh, uh, privacy reviews and um, guidance for uh, software systems, and an organization called Apti. And we worked with them on working out what our governance model should be, what our uh, privacy policies and procedures should be. Um, so one thing uh, we learned here was, um, well, I'll go on to the database to kind of explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, so there are things that MongoDB made very easy for us to do. Like uh, We found as the uh, application was progressing, as things were going on, that we wanted to be able to add fields. Like at the beginning, there was no such thing as a variant of concern in COVID-19 as the virus evolved and as different outbreaks seemed to like have different genetic strains and different characteristics people wanted to track this information so we add that uh, to the database in like april 2020 there were no vaccines for covid19 later on as people start to get vaccinated people are interested in well which vaccine did people have uh, when did they have the dose relative to when they um, got infected, how many doses have they had? And we uh, started adding all of this. MongoDB makes it very easy to do that because it doesn't have any sort of uh, like schema conformance 
uh, built in. You just like are storing JSON documents or BSON documents, which is a binary version of JSON. So you just add your field. Right, great, done. But searching on that is incredibly slow because MongoDB doesn't know anything about the structure of the document object. It can't make any assumptions about how to uh, find data that is stored in these uh, uh, documents. So you have to create an index for every query that you want to run, which means, like, and this was a point where, before we realized this, it was costing us $4,000 a month in like cloud hosting to host this database because we were going around it with these queries are really slow we must need like bigger aws instances you know bigger ec2 let's put more cpu on the ec2 let's put more uh, memory on and getting like you know incrementally better results and then i realized that while we had a bunch of indexes they weren't matching the queries we wanted to make re organized the indexes and got that uh, cost down by 75%, so under $1,000 a month, just by running the, you know, uh, having correct ind indexes for the queries. But every time a researcher wanted to do something new, we had to work out what that was and then write the query for that. So it made this sort of exploratory approach to mining the data uh, very difficult. Um, so, yeah, what we've uh, really found is that like, if you want to build something that is new that you know that solves a new problem it's really quite a good idea to choose boring technology because if you start choosing exciting new technology you're now solving two problems what how does this technology work and how do the, do i enable the research i want to do and enabling the research was a big enough problem for us to handle without also trying to work out how terraform worked and how mongodb worked and how you know all of these uh, new toys that we were playing with uh, worked. So uh, this is what the um, filter thing looks like. This was our attempt to constrain users in the filters that they run so that it matches uh, the, the the indexes that we have provided on the database. Yeah, we, we wanted people to only run queries that we could actually support and the way we do that is uh, by only letting them choose these fields. Uh, yeah, and then um, geocoding is a separate kettle of fish. It's really difficult. Uh, so luckily, there are various external providers. Unluckily, they all charge per API use. They don't let you cache because then you wouldn't be using their API as much and they would charge you less. So there's very various limitations around those. And what we found is you really need to standardize your representation of the data. We were using the names of the countries. This is hard. If you search for the country United States, you might think someone meant the United States of America, but they might mean the United States minor outlying islands or the United States Virgin Islands, and you would get results back for those. So we switched to uh, ISO codes to make sure that we were being accurate and precise about that. Um, and now back to Abhishek. Thanks, Graham. So, uh, Graham talked earlier about uh, the issue of you know having so much data about people who you know in some ways didn't really consent or couldn't consent uh, you know in a any reasonable way to the fact that their data is now in this big database. Uh, so, one of the first things to that you know to keep in mind is that you know free text is very problematic. Uh, we did have you know some free text in in the notes fields. We had to curate our notes when people were adding the data. And uh, you know, some like patient lives with family here, and you know, from school, and that's you know, uh, if there's only one record with that, it's you know, pro very much uh, could be correlated with uh, other information to actually identify the person. And this is quite useful in curation, but you know, this should not be generally accessible. So you know, we first thing we did was we like, oh, okay, move it to a restricted notes field. You know, but once you restrict it, you know, there's fewer people using it, which means uh, it's that, that part is just bit rotting. So we, then we said, all right, just remove the notes field. We'll figure out a way uh, if we need to attach notes later on. Uh, we, we did see that you know, once uh, the stage of the pandemic moved where curation, manual curation was not possible anyway, uh, then there is no need to keep a notes field. Um, so. I think the key is to strike a balance and keep updating as you know requirements change. So initially, the priority was to get as much data to researchers, but then of course we have to think about privacy as well. Um, so uh, age is quite another sensitive variable. Uh, so generally, the whole idea is you know this idea of k anonymity. So where you want uh, 
as many people with the same parameters or, or the same variable attributes as possible so that you can't identify one person. Uh, we don't have personal PII, but even having one person, one patient with a particular set of uh, attributes makes it possible to identify. So this is something we are working towards. We've already implemented this for our monkey box data, but we'll be working to implement it in COVID as well. So we bucketed age into five-year intervals, and that sort of reduces the issue a bit. Uh, looking forward, we want to integrate monkeypox into the platform. We want to support reproducible research, improve the API, support more filters in the API, uh, support data and snapshot for fair, uh, you know, you want to sure that the data set that was used for research is accessible and uh, integrate with clinical data and also make it easier for our platform to be deployed so anyone can set their, set their uh, own global health up on their own infrastructure. Key takeaways, uh, you know, keep it simple, use boring technologies as much as possible, but also use new things when they're appropriate. Uh, uh, Use standards as much as possible. ISO codes everywhere, ISO dates everywhere, please. Uh, uh, about pretext, that's a nightmare. Uh, UX is very important. You want to make sure that people who, who have to use your data can use your data very well. Uh, scaling up is non-trivial, but you need to do it. And privacy is important. As much as possible, try to make sure that the privacy requirements are realized before you start the project or during the early stages rather than later on. And the main thing is you can't always know your audience or the needs. That's life. But we have to live with it. And thanks to everyone uh, who have worked on this project. Uh, we, have, uh, we have the team and Global Health Health and also the Google Fellows uh, who have, uh, you know, who started the project. Uh, and we're all grateful to everyone in this list. And more, uh, you know, uh, front end and UX, thanks to the HDD. Uh, in Poland, and also curators in our monkey box repo. Uh, so thanks, thanks for everyone for coming to talk. Thank you. And just a reminder to ask questions on Slido. And in the meantime, what are the blind spots on the map where you are not getting data? We're not getting data in a lot of cases. Um, our data is best in uh, Latin America because a lot of the governments there are being proactive about publishing it. Um, America started off badly, became very good, and then individual states became a bit bad again. So you know, it's quite variable. Um, but like, not a lot across uh, Europe and Eastern Europe and not so much in Asia. And sometimes it's because uh, they're using weird formats that we don't support. Like a lot of the governments publish data on a like public sort of spreadsheet-like platform ca called Tableau that doesn't have an API, so we can't automatically um, uh, ingest that data. Thank you. So let's go to the questions on Slido. So first question: Do you actually have to re-ingest large data, as mentioned, CDC data again and again? It seems like something that should be extended incrementally with just the new data. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, indeed, we do do that for certain countries where there is things like unique IDs. So we can know that this unique ID is new, and we already have data for unique IDs older than this. Uh, unfortunately, many countries do not have uh, unique IDs or stable identifiers, and they do change old data. We have seen that. They even uh, there are countries with EUIDs that change data, like even changing gender. Basically, they just renumbered it, which means it's it's a fairly difficult problem to uh, ingest just the new data uh, because the old data could have changed. And then it's just easier, in some sense, to you know ingest everything at once. Uh, uh, do you think you will reach a point where your data schema is stable enough to swap? Uh, to a relational database, and would you want to? We often had the like, wouldn't it be better if we were just using Postgres <laughs> discussion in the in the office time and time again? And like, I think that it probably would in many ways, but we haven't actually validated that. You know, like we all have this idea that. Um, that it would be faster or more scalable or whatever using Postgres and MongoDB. 
but we haven't actually demonstrated that. Like nobody has sort of loaded all of the data into that structure and run the queries and demonstrated whether it's any any faster or not. One thing I will say in defense of MongoDB is that their support people have been great. And you know, we, the amount that we spend on support is way less than the amount it would cost us to be running the thing without their help. So, uh, you know, that, that kind of avenue, that like, technical expertise from the provider has really helped us to uh, to get around some of our pain points. So a last question. I see there are a couple of questions regarding the same topic, uh, looking at re-identification and uh, privacy. So did you have to persuade anyone that the data was su sufficiently de-identified? Uh, how do you identify possible risks? Uh, how do you avoid identifiable data in free text? So as I m mentioned, we use uh, an agency called AWO who are e um, experts at uh, this kind of work. And essentially they acted as our first like, uh, you know, barrier of compliance. Like, you know, they, we would say this is the way we want to work and they would say, well, that's bad and like, here is the specific text in someone's specific law somewhere that says why this is bad. And then we would come back with another proposal. And, you know, we sort of negotiated on something that met our expectations of doing open science with open data and met their expectations around anonymization and re-identification. We don't have any sort of external validity, um, but on the monkeypox data, you probably know more about this than I do, so I'll, I'll let you talk about that. Yes, on monkeypox data, we are collaborating with EU and HDX, uh, and one of the fruitful things of the collaboration is that we sort of started implementing the key anonymity measures in that. So their goal is less than 5% data should be identifiable, and we are meeting that on monkeypox. Uh, you know, of course, ideally it should be zero, but the question is, for example, index cases, you know, the first case in a country, that's always going to be identifiable in a way. So it's, it's a trade-off between privacy and, you know, the interest for researchers. Okay, thank you. If you have any other questions, please ask after the session. So thank you again. Thank you.